Good morning. Uh, this uh, is an OCAP review course. It's condensed from four hours originally, <laughs> okay, to one hour. Okay, so there's a lot to cover in, in UVI. So I'm trying to hit highlights that I think will be good yield for you guys on your examination. A combination of cases, questions that you that are clinically relevant. Okay, questions that are obscure that you're going to see on your examination. Uh, and pictures, okay? So we'll start with a 27-year-old white male, pain, photophobia, ciliary flush, uh, lower back pain, differential diagnosis, okay? So this is patient presenting with acute anterior uveitis, okay? Non-granulomous anterior uveitis. The uh, differential diagnosis, idiopathic number one, the B HLA B27 associated spondyloarthropathies, herpes, lens-induced Bechet's drug, TINU and uh, Posner Schlossman syndrome, okay? TINU, tubular uh, interstitial nephritis, and uveitis syndrome. The uh, important uh, things to elicit on your history lower back pain, oral genital ulcers, skin lesions, arthritis, GI symptoms, medication use, and labs, you know, syphilis, serology, and a B27 would be probably the most important, okay, to get but a CBC and a basic metabolic profile. Sacroiliac films uh, are the films to get for patients. It's a board type of question uh, rather than lumbar sacral spine films, which you see here. So the LS uh, lumbosacral spine films, you know, uh, show uh, ankylosis. The game's over by, by that point in time. Sacroiliitis is a common feature of the B27 associated disease. So if they ask you what film to order, sacred iliac film. The rheumatologists hardly ever order these films anymore. They go straight to MRI. What is this? Right, and what do you see that with? Reactive Formerly known as? Writers. The etiology of which is thought to be? Usually, I mean, it could be from uh, those bugs that cause diarrhea. Yeah, exactly. So it's enteric bacteria are thought to actually precipitate this in a, in, in a genetically predisposed person. What is this? We're on the theme of seronegative spondyloarthropathies. So they may show you a clinical something like this. This is a patient with, psor with psoriasis. Okay, so psoriatic arthritis is something you have to think about. Uh, what is this? Okay, in this setting. Okay, so it's a pseudophagic patient, right, with a capsular plaque, okay, and if you're given a history that this patient has a delayed onset of endophthalmitis, you might think that the patient may have an, actually an in indolent bacterial infection with P. acnes or uh, fungi. So capsular plaque, delayed onset endophthalmitis. These are just, you know, we can go into way more detail, but just make these associations in your mind. Iris nodules. They may ask you about that. They love to ask you about the difference between kepi and Busaka nodules, okay? So this is an example of a patient with sarcoidosis with granulomatous inflammation. Um, kepi are on the pupillary margin. margin. Kepi, you can with a P, and Busaka are, where are Busaka nodules? Not so the stroma. Right, the stroma, exactly, okay? Um, herpes. Okay. There are usually stigmata of herpetic infection in patients with herpes. Not always. You can have herpes sine herpete, but you know, for board purposes and clinically, you should always look for stigmata. Okay, so uh, in the panel to your left, you have a patient with an immune ring. Okay, stromal keratitis on the right. Patient with sectoral iris atrophy. True or false? Sectoral iris atrophy is pathognomonic for varicella zoster uh, infection of the eye. False. Okay, right. So you can see them in either one of them. Differential diagnosis of diffusely uh, distributed KP, herpes. Think about herpes number one. Um, sarcoid can do that, but it also can give you kind of uh, uh, granulomous inflammation in all its triangle. Fuchs uh, will classically give you uh, so-called stellate KP, which this is an example of, and toxoplasmosis. Uveitis with elevated intraocular pressure. Useful to know in the clinic, too, okay? So herpes, number one, number two, number three, okay? 
Herpes is number one. Then, of course, the more unusual thing, Posner Schlossman, which is also thought to be herpes, right? <laughs> it's thought to be due to a CMV. Uh, Fuchs heterochromic erythrocyclitis is more of an indolent inflammation that's associated with uveitis, very low grade uveitis, and, and uh, elevated intraocular pressure, sarcoid, and toxoplasmosis. Okay. So, 25 year old white male presents with the first episode of severe non granulomas unilateral hypopion uveitis. What laboratories would be the most appropriate for the initial workup? None, because it's his first episode. ANA and rheumatoid factor, FTA and HLA B27, PBD, chest radiograph, angiotensin covering enzyme. Anybody? C. C, yeah, right. Okay, so B27 offers prognostic inf uh, information for the patient. It's not diagnostic, obviously, but it's important to know because if you make this diagnosis, you get them in the hands of a rheumatologist, you get them on maybe disease modifying medication. Um, you know, he's presenting with severe uveitis. You wouldn't just say, oh, it's your first episode. See ya, right? <laughs> um, particularly if they come here, they're coming from an opinion, okay? 35-year-old white guy presents with pain, redness, photophobia, poor vision in his right eye. He's got mutton fat KP, microhyphemia, hyphema, blood cells, and white cells in his anterior chamber. One plus flare, posterior sneakia, and high pressure. What are you thinking about in this patient? <clears throat> the micro you think of like Amsler's sign? So yeah, right. Okay. Well, Amsler's sign, yeah, is, uh, Amsler's sign is not a micro hyphema, but Amsler's sign is actually uh, blood in the angle, right? Uh, after paracentesis, that's how it's been described. In patients uh, with? Fuchs heterochromic. Right, but do you think this is Fuchs heterochromic urocyclitis? So what, what gives you this constellation of fine? high pressure? What do you think of high pressure? Herpes. Herpes. Uh, what is that sectoral iris atrophy due to? It's a kind of infarction of the iris, okay? So you can have ischemia, you can have, uh, you can have either granulomas or non-granulomas KP with herpes, can do anything, and you can have uh, hyphema and bleeding in the eye. So this is the kind of question they'll ask you on the boards, because it makes you confuses you a little bit. So the answer would have been the sectoral? What's that? On that question, the answer would have been the sectoral? I'm um, sorry, yeah, sectoral translumination defects and decreased corneal sensation. Sorry. So they're looking for herpes. Is it varicella zoster? Probably. Okay. okay, so in contrast, 12-year-old girl with chronic non granulomatous inflammation, white eye, and a cataract. Okay, quasi articular arthritis. The di differential chronic non granulomatous antiuveitis, JIA. Okay, in a child, most common systemic association. Fuchs, sarcoid syphilis TB, can pretty much do anything, but it would be very unusual to have TB, right? Uh, herpes and immune constitution uveitis. Workup uh, as uh, before CBC, uh, basic metabolic profile, and ANA. This is a situation in which an ANA is actually useful, okay, uh, in a child because ANA positivity in a posterior kid with uh, non-granulomous anti-uveitis is, you know, a risk factor, okay, for uveitis. Um, Lyme disease in an endemic area, I would order it, okay, if I were living in New York City or Long Island, okay, uh, Lyme disease is, is prevalent in that area. I would order it if you had something else, you know, that was tipping you over, okay, so wouldn't order it here. Okay, Dr. Bell, you know, um, I think you've had this consult, actually. Uh, or some, when I think it was this five-year-old kid with you know, uh, desquamating rash on their fingertips, uh, kind of a strawberry kind of tongue, and rosy and lips that are erythematous. So, diagnosis Kawasaki's disease. Okay, okay. This, they love to ask stuff like this. Okay, so it's you know, what, what you, we've seen two cases in the last three years. So mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome, usually children under the age of 10, they have this erythematous disquamid of a rash in their extremities and their oral mucosa, as you saw, fever, painless cervical adenopathy. The thing that is important to know about this entity is that they can get myocarditis and coronary arteritis. So that's important. They need to be, the diagnosis needs to be made, and usually they're treated with high dose of steroids. 
ocularly they can get a bilateral conjunctivitis which spares the limbus and some get uh, anterior uveitis very early in the course of their disease. So just a tribute to my buddy here, okay? So what disease are we going to be talking about in a minute? Everybody knows who the guy on the left is, right? Yes. Okay, it's David Bowie. He passed away last week or two weeks ago. And he had iris heterochromia, but not due to Fuchs, okay, but due to trauma. So we're going to, this is Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis or Fuchs uveitis syndrome. Um, there's iris heterochromia classically. Usually the lighter iris color is in brown eyes and, and darker in blue. There are classically stellate precipitates. Findings that are very common are cataract and elevated intraocular pressure. Okay? The other thing is that they typically will have a very low grade iritis, let one plus cell or less, that's usually not very responsive to corticosteroids and the absence of posterior sneakia. Okay? So Low-grade inflammation, no posterior sneaky, high pressure, cataract. Iris heterochromia does not necessarily have to be present, but it, it can be. And glaucoma, okay? It's usually unilateral. The other thing about it is that frequently they will have cells in their anterior vitreous, okay? So it's, they can have kind of an anterior intermediate type of uveitis. So frequently patients with Fuchs will complain of floaters. Um, the thing that you need also to know about, about Fuchs is that uh, there's very good evidence that rubella virus is pathoetiologic in, in this disease entity, okay? by both PCR and Goldman-Whitmer coefficient of patients with this disease. So what's the next therapeutic step in a five-year-old with uh, GIA associated erythrocyclitis with uh, oligoarticular disease um, that is unresponsive to topical corticosteroids with progressive visual loss? This is a patient that comes into my clinic. This is a typical kind of patient. B. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Uh, why would it not be methotrexate alone? Six to eight weeks alone. Yeah, exactly. So it takes time. You have to put the fire out with some something, okay? And you have to, in most cases, we bridge, you know, uh, anti-metabolites with uh, corticosteroids. And systemic corticosteroids uh, are less apt to produce you know, ocular side effects and topical, which the patients are usually on for a long time when they come in. Okay, a 19-year-old female, age is important, 19-year-old female with bilateral anterior uh, uveitis, uh, vitreous cells, after about a fevers, arthrologist, increased serum creatinine, and eosinophiluria, okay? Anybody know what the diagnosis is? Just based on that history? TINU, TINU right, T-I-N-U, right. So there's a bimodal distribution in this disease, usually in young girls and then in older adolescents or older women, usually around the age of 30. Bilateral non-granulomous anterior uveitis. Think about it. And there is a good screening test for this. Um, anybody know what that is? Beta Urinary beta-2 microblock. Exactly, right. And there are criteria for the diagnosis, okay? Um, and the ultimate diagnosis is really made on uh, renal biopsy. But, you know, we uh, don't does usually do Does it have to be bilateral? Yes, it usually does, yeah. And most of them respond to topical corticosteroids, <coughs> though I have a couple of cases, I have one patient who's on immunosuppressive medication. So in a large series, about, I don't know, 11% of patients will, will require heavy UV treatment. Okay, 20-year-old white female, floaters, decreased vision, snowballs, episodic paresthesias. Uh, this is a patient with intermediate uveitis, okay? So the designation intermediate uveitis until proven uh, otherwise, until proven, um, you know, idiopathic. Uh, intermediate uveitis can be associated with systemic conditions, and it is, in terms of nomenclature, referred to as intermediate uveitis associated with X. Okay, why is it? Okay, if it is not associated with that, it is an idiopathic condition known as pars planitis. Right. So here you have classic findings on intermediate uveitis. Um, you have vascular uh, cuffing, macular edema, and uh, staining of peripheral renal vessels. So the differential diagnosis: 
uh, are uh, idiopathic diseases I mentioned, pars planitis, and then MS is associated with intermediate uveitis, sarcoid, syphilis, TB, Lyme, and then uncommon diseases. One question that I'd like to ask uh, is, in a young woman who is HLA-DR2 positive, okay, what is the chance, what is the likelihood or the risk of multiple sclerosis associated with that disease? And it's about 15% in five years. Okay. So what you need to know is that pars planitis okay, in a young woman with symptoms may be associated with the development of MS. Okay. So uh, in terms of the workup, you want to ex exclude uh, syphilis, sarcoid, and TB, um, Lyme serology where appropriate, and then consider a neurologic workup for MS. Okay. In, in, for me, I think that uh, I would consider a neurologic workup. We see a lot of patients with pars planitis that don't have <clears throat> MS. But if, if there is something that, uh, <coughs> if there's another symptom that's associated with it, then I would send them to neurology and consider getting an MRI scan. Because, as you know, early treatment is, is effective okay, in MS. A question regarding the TB part of that. We've had What's a couple patients over the last year or so um, have an intermediate UBS and a chronic parent gold has come back positive. Right. And we decided it was latent TB, but they need to be treated for that. So you need to see something like a granuloma or a serpiginoid reaction to really say this is truly due to the tuberculosis? I, I think so, because I think that intermediate uveitis is so, it would be really uncommon to, to produce only intermediate uveitis. I think that may be a, a finding, particularly in a white person, in a low endemic area. So the likelihood of the positive predictive value of a positive quantiferin goal in this place, okay, is very, very, very low, okay? The patient's an immigrant, you know, if they have pulmonary findings and things like that, then it's a different story. So, you know, there are people that have, you know, exposure to TB and then they develop intermediate UVS. I can't tell you with certainty that they're not necessarily related, okay? But I think that in most cases, uh, you know, the question is not so much do you need to treat them, but what do you need to treat them with, right? right? Okay, so that patient may just require INH and Fampin for, for six months, whereas a person with a tuberculoma requires four drug therapy. Does that make sense? Uh, I do one question that they like to ask, which I can't remember the answer to, is what drug not to put people on in case they might have MS in the future. Oh, yeah. Bad so, I mean, you know, I, we were going to get to that a little bit later, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, there are, uh, there's a whole class of, of drugs that, uh, you know, that can can promote demyelination. Anybody knows what they know what they are? TNF the TNF inhibitors, okay? So TNF inhibitors would be contraindicated in a patient with a family history or, fam you know, with a suspicion of MS, okay? And it can also promote demyelination in patients with underlying MS. Okay. Um, so it's a little tricky in young women, okay, uh, that you may want to put on a TNF inhibitor. I would get an MRI scan on those patients. Okay. Sarcoidosis can produce any type of uh, uveitis. 25% um, of sarcoidosis patients may have uveitis. The lungs affected, lung, skin, reticular, endothelial system, and the eye, okay. Um, ACE and lysozyme, you know, are uh, useful um, in patients with active disease, but they're not diagnostic, uh, as they are nonspecific and can be elevated in other entities such as TB leprosy, um, uh, osteoarthritis. Um, ACE is also physiologically elevated in children and decreased in patients on ACE inhibitors. These are board type of questions, okay? You know, there is a, ACE is not really diagnostically helpful, but it, but it helps you put, put it in the ballpark and it's one of the laboratory tests that the workshop on the diagnosis of uh, sarcoidosis is suggested that would be possibly suggestive of that diagnosis, as we'll see in the next slide. Um, abnormal liver enzyme tests um, are actually helpful, okay? So the liver is not uncommonly uh, affected. You know, so if I had to get LFTs or ACE and lysis, I'm get LFTs for a patient. The best screening test is really a chest x-ray, okay? because 90% of patients with active disease will have an abnormal chest x-ray. 
in patients in whom you, ha you suspect having granulomas intraocular inflammation and may have sarcoidosis and have a normal chest x-ray, I would get a thin cut CT scan because there has been studies to suggest that a CT scan may be more sensitive than a chest x-ray and reveal pulmonary pathology that would not otherwise be seen on a, a normal plain film. Diagnosis is tissue biopsy, okay? Definitive diagnosis, definite sarcoidosis requires tissue. Um, obviously, the lungs uh, are a good place to go, but you know, if you can biopsy a place that's not in the lungs, you know, that's not invasive, uh, it, it's preferable. So it's always behooves you to look, you know, uh, on the conjunctiva for a nodule uh, to the parotid gland, uh, lacrimal lacrimal glands and the skin. So the skin is also a good place. Lupus pernio uh, is a um, finding that you see particularly in African-American patients around the nasolabial folds that, uh, that can give you the diagnosis. <clears throat> Just to show you some of the ocular findings in sarcoidosis, you know, def there are categories definitive, presumed, probable, and possible, okay? Definitive is biopsy positive, presumed, compatible uveitis with hyalur adenopathy, but no biopsy. And then uh, probable, you know, compatible uveitis, no hyalur adenopathy uh, uh, and no biopsy, but three signs and two laboratory investigations. So here we're getting into this murky area of probable disease. 60% um, of these uh, people will probably have sarcoidosis if they're biopsy. And the findings that you see are these tent-like PAS in the upper left and the upper right, uh, granulomas in the in back of the eye with uh, optic nerve involvement and candle wax drippings uh, to the right, Snow, snowballs, uh, uh, so-called snowballs, they're you know, inflammatory precipitates in the inferior retina, and <clears throat> these punctate areas of, um, uh, of corduretinal involvement in the periphery are classically seen in patients with uh, sarcoid, making sarcoid an important differential in the diagnosis of what white dot syndrome? Bird shot, okay? So they can look similar. So you, uh, I always think about sarcoidosis in patients that are, that are presented, that are uh, referred in with, with uh, sarcoid. What's this? I'm from Long Island, I ride horses. <laughs> Oh, is it, what is the name of this rash? It's diagnostic of this condition. Erythema migrans, okay? Okay, this is the rash associated with Lyme disease. You can see that it has this targetoid appearance. Okay, this in the context of exposure in an endemic area is diagnostic, actually, okay? <clears throat> so, oops, sorry. Lyme disease, tick-borne disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, um, uh, north, northeast, mid-Atlantic states, bimodal distribution of kids and older people. Okay, because those are the people that are out hiking and stuff. Uh, there are systemic stages of the disease, just as there are in syphilis, because it's a, you know, spirochetal disease, right? So, early in the disease, you have erythema migrans. Then there's a disseminated hematogenous spread of the disease with fever, meningitis, Bell's palsy, um, arrhythmia, and arthritis. Bell's palsy is something to always think about okay, in a patient from an endemic area. It's a very common finding in patients with Lyme disease. And then in a persistent disease, which is really difficult to treat, is arthritis and neurologic symptoms. There are many ocular manifestation, manifestations that depend on the stage of the disease. In very early disease, conjunctivitis and anterior uveitis, but <clears throat> in the uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me in the disseminated uh, disease, you see mostly intermediate uveitis, but a posterior uveitis can evolve in this disease. It is a clinical diagnosis with supportive serology. Uh, PCR has been uh, done on ocular fluids and on skin lesions. Uh, the major differential in a child would be JIA. And the treatment is with IV antibiotics at neurologic doses, just as you would treat syphilis, okay? You may get a Lyme disease question, okay? Erythema migrans, Bell's palsy. What's up, Brian? Often do you see patients that you think have Lyme disease? Where here? Mediatis from Lyme disease, yeah. I think I've seen two or three cases. Just because we're not in an endemic 
Yeah. 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 It's very uncommon here. I've seen Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but not, not Lyme disease. But, you know, there are people that, it's another story. Okay? People get <laughs> tested for Lyme disease by other physicians all the time. The problem with the diagnosis with Lyme disease, the testing is not very sensitive or specific. Okay? So, um, you know, in terms of testing, there's an ELISA test and there's a Western blot. Right? So if you have a positive ELISA, it always should be reflexed to a Western blot. You should have at least three or four bands positivity on the Western blot to make the diagnosis. Plus arthrologists and a history. Right? Not just I'm feeling poorly, right? Okay. The hallmark of the presentation of intermediate uveitis is What is intermediate uveitis? What's the answer here? C. C, right. So it's it's based in the vitreous in the peripheral retina. Okay. The progno prognostic factors for visual outcome in parsimonitis, a poor prognostic would be what? C. Sorry? C. D? D. Well, that's a prognostic factor for the development of MS. Okay, but a poor prognostic factor would be earlier age at onset. It kind of makes sense. Okay, if you have the disease longer, the visual prognosis is worse. Did you say? I said C. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> anyway. Did you change? Well, yeah, because you said D, and then it's like D. No, I thought you said I thought you said D, but don't worry. We'll go to the board and have them change your answer. Thank you. All right. So. It's not just a younger age of presentation, but um, kids seem to have a more severe presentation for the disease. I'm sure that, you know, Jim has seen patients in, in our clinic, and some kids that present with the intermediate uveitis, and then they got a lot of cells in their vitreous, worse than older kids. So sarcoid uveitis is characterized by? Yeah, all of those things, exactly. So, you know, syphilis and sarcoid, cause a protein manifestation of disease. Okay, here we go. 25-year-old white female horse rider from Long Island. Bilateral intermediate uveitis with periphlebitis and snowbanks. Um, in addition to study, you know, discussion about MS, what would you order in this patient? Intermediate uveitis with risk factors for Lyme disease. Yeah. Okay. So this is a guy that actually presented to my clinic, a 61-year-old man with a history of rheumatoid arthritis, um, extensive travel history. He was on Enbrel and presented with his temporal area of retinal whitening, initially referred in with a branch of vein occlusion. Um, didn't have a branch of vein occlusion because the next day he evolved into more botrytis and severe presentation. We actually took him to the OR at that time because he had a fairly large differential diagnosis given his travel history and his PCR of his vitreous was positive for varicella zoster. So the diagnosis of this patient was acute retinal necrosis syndrome due to you know, varicella zoster. So the differential diagnosis of multifocal retinitis okay, with vasculitis include the necrotizing herpetic retinopathies, ARN, PORN syndrome, CMV, toxoplasmosis, syphilis, sarcoid, TB, Bartonella, and then, you know, uh, metastatic uh, bacterial infections. It's very important to know whether or not the patient is immunocompetent or not, okay, because that will also uh, influence, you know, your differential diagnosis, okay. So CMV retinitis would be a common uh, retinitis, uh, retinitis in patients, you know, with, with AIDS who are immunocompromised, plus a um, disease like toxoplasmosis in an immunocompromised patient can look completely different than it would in a patient who is immunocompetent. Okay. So just a word about ARN, you know, it presents unilaterally in about a third of patients uh, with acute pain, redness, decreased vision, granulomas, antriuveitis, may have elevated intraocular pressure, and the fellow eye may be involved, you know, within a week or even 20 years down the road. Okay, so-called BARN or bilateral antriuveitis. In the acute phase, there are these multiple white yellow lesions in the retinal periphery which coalesce and then uh, centripetally 
extend to the posterior pole, you may see retinal hemorrhages. Always see vasculitis. Always see botrytis. Okay, so it's part of the definition of the disease. Late stage, you have widespread uh, atrophy, pigmentary changes, and a very high instance, sorry, of uh, retinal detachment. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis, okay? So you make the diagnosis by looking at the eye and then obtain, uh, you know, confirmatory anterior chamber or vitreous fluid, depending upon how broad your differential diagnosis is. Um, the sensitivity and specificity for PCR is actually quite good with an anterior chamber tap if you think that this is only, this is the only entity. Okay, so if the, if you have other intervening historical factors, patient's been on a, he's an IV drug abuser, he's been in the hospital, with, you know, he's got a history of of possible risk factors for endogenous endophthalmitis. I would take him to the OR and do a vitreous biopsy. But if patient's walking in, an otherwise healthy young person with a classic history of ARN, you know, I would do an AC tap, inject them with antivirals, and put them on an antiviral medication. Sorry. So the conventional regimen would be IV acyclovir, okay, um, followed by uh, PO acyclovir to decrease the uh, risk of the fellow eye involvement. Alternative regimens are oral val acyclovir, famvir, or val gancyclovir. Um, so basically, you need to treat them with acyclovir, okay, whether it's IV or oral, okay. Oral doses of uh, Valtrex at two grams three times a day are equivalent to IV dosing. Um, in general, uh, I w if a patient that presents with an acute situation, I'll put them on high doses of oral Valtrex and inject them. Uh, with uh, antiviral medication, usually uh, phosphocarnate, but sometimes a combination of the two, and put them on an aspirin to decrease the risk of occlusive vasculitis and prednisone, okay, after they've been on the medication for 24 hours, okay, because there's a significant inflammatory component to this disease. So it's, again, the principle of never treating um, an infectious disease with prednisone monotherapy. Okay, and allowing, you know, your antiviral medication to, you know, at least have a chance to work. Right. Rental detachment is common. The prognosis is good. The prognosis is really variable. Okay, this is the literature, but in reality, uh, there's a tremendous variation in the prognosis. You know, there really is, and it probably has to do with host factors, um, as well as bug factors. Sixteen-year-old white male with a Unilateral uh, focus of retinitis, um, vitreous, vitritis, and vitritis over this lesion. So the differential is toxo, okay? And these other entities, the labs I would order are listed here. Um, his toxo titers were extremely positive, okay? The clinical diagnosis of toxoplasmosis is made in this patient. Okay, um, just the classic, this is how he evolved, okay? Uh, on anti-toxoplasmic uh, therapy with, with uh, triple classic therapy with pure methamine, sulfadiazine, and full lenic acid, and steroids, because he had a lot of vitritis, okay? Uh, you know, usually after it, and usually I, the vitritis is not that bad. Sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Um, Periocular steroids are contraindicated, okay? The reason for this is if you put a depot in there, you can't get it out, and you've got an infectious disease that may just explode the eye. Same would be true for intravitreal injections of steroids. There are lots of case reports of toxo and syphilis and uh, ARN that, in which the eyes just explode with intravitreal you know, patients that, in which the differential wasn't considered, and uh, you know they've been given intravitreal steroid injections. So the, this is always, you know, who do you treat the toxoplasmosis? I usually treat everybody, okay, that comes in. Um, although I think a small, you know, active, very tiny peripheral lesion could probably be observed, okay? Sometimes I might do that. But uh, usually they come in with some symptoms, okay, with botrytis. So if they have botrytis and an active disease, I think they need treatment. But it's recommended 
that if you have any kind of lesion that's vision threatening, which most of them seem to be, okay, in the macular optic nerve or popular macular bundle, visually significant vitritis, or certainly in an immunocompromised patient, they require treatment. Um, how do you treat them? Uh, huh. I must have missed a slide here, guys. I'm sorry. There's the uh, classic uh, treatment with, like this other patient, with triple therapy with, uh, you know, sulfa, daraprim, and folinic acid. Um, there are some alternative treatments that are uh, helpful. Clindamycin uh, and sulfadiazine can uh, be added. You need to uh, be aware of pseudomembranous colitis with clindamycin. Many practitioners will use Bactrim, okay? So in a patient with a peripheral lesion that's not threatening vision, I think that's a really good choice because it's cheap, it's effective, um, and, uh, and, and useful patient. In a patient with a uh, lesion that's threatening their, their optic nerve or their macula, I would try to put them on um, triple therapy, although it's really hard to obtain the drugs. As you know, you know, it's just ridiculously expensive, uh, or used to, was, okay? Um, and it's hard to obtain. It's hard for the patients to actually take, you know, all those medications. So there are alternatives that have actually been shown to be pretty effective. So if I can get it, um, atovaquone is actually very helpful, 750 three times a day, and azithromycin plus pyrimethamine, maybe plus or minus pyrimethamine are useful medications. In patients that do not tolerate um, I, systemic therapy, intravitreal clindamycin with or without dexamethasone may be actually very useful, and I've used that as well uh, in pregnant patients and patients that just can't take systemic medicine. So a couple of questions about Toxo. So I just want to show you a couple of pictures. Up in the top left, classic Toxo, okay? So scar and satellite lesion with vitritis, okay? Um, to the right is a patient with AIDS, okay, with toxoplasmosis. You don't know what's going on in this patient, okay? It's a necrotizing retinitis that can be bilateral, may simulate CMV retinitis. Always scan AIDS patients with toxoplasmosis because about 15% of the time they'll have um, ring enhancing lesions in the brain that are due to toxoplasmosis, okay? The lesion on the right is in a patient with acquired toxoplasmosis. So it can happen just with, and it's usually unilateral, usually um, without, a, uh, without a satellite lesion, okay? IgA is usually helpful in that. So these are board type of questions. Most ocutoxoplasmosis is congenital disease, true or false? It's false, okay? Um, recent studies have suggested that actually, and due to epidemiologic studies in Brazil, um, and due to recent epidemics, that acquired postnatal disease probably represents about two-thirds of the cases, okay? So, the classic teaching was that it's a congenital disease with reactivation later on in life. The current thinking is probably it is a, a more often acquired disease postnatally, okay? So um, requires, you know, treatment paradigms for, you know, not only pregnant women, but also, you know, in preventing kids from uh, getting the disease. Acquired disease comes from eating undercooked beef or exposure to cats. Okay, Most, mostly false, okay? Okay, so, uh, you know, this is a little bit of nitpicking stuff, but I think that if you had, if you had, it had contaminated uh, ground beef, okay, uh, litter boxes, not cats themselves, all right, and um, water actually is probably an extremely important contaminant, okay? So contaminated water from, f from feral cats doing their thing in the reservoir. Ocutoxoplasmosis is a clinical diagnosis. Laboratory testing is supportive only. True or false? True. Mostly. Okay. True, mostly. I agree with that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there would be certain exceptions in which, like the CMV retinitis patient, you would want to get some laboratories. When, when is laboratory testing, when does it really help you? When, when it's negative, PR. right? If it's negative, patient doesn't have toxoplasmosis, right? So 
mostly true, except when you have an atypical presentation, okay, like an immunocompromised host, you might want to actually obtain PCR of their aqueous or their vitreous, or get serological testing. Um, and then a negative test can be helpful because it excludes the diagnosis, okay? What is this? Neuroretinitis. Neuroretinitis. Right, okay, uh, involving the optic nerve and this patient with a, uh, with a incomplete macular star. So the most common cause of neuroretinitis is um, probably Bartonella, okay, Bartonella Hensleyae or Quintana. Um, again, a ch mostly a childhood illness. Um, they will present with systemic disease with an erythematous pap papule at the site of their inoculation with a flu like illness and regional adenopathy. So that history. It's actually important okay, to elicit that history in the kid. Um, it can, uh, ocular disease includes you know, paranoid ocular glandular syndrome and neuroretinitis. Um, neuroretinitis is um, you know, a broad differential diagnosis, including infectious entities, syphilis, Lyme, TB, Dusen, Toxo, Toxicara, uh, sarcoidosis, and then vasculopathic entities. As far as Bartonella is concerned, there's no, there are no definitive treatment guidelines for neuroanitis associated with it because the prognosis is usually quite good. 85% of patients will have visual cues 20, 20 fifths or better. However, patients have systemic disease. They need to be treated usually with uh, erythro, well, doxycycline and rifampin. So peripapillary scarring, punched out mid-peripheral scars, choroidal knee vascularization, absence of vitreous cells. What diagnosis is this? What, right, ocular histoplasmosis syndrome. Okay. This is a lady, a patient of mine, older lady with floaters and uh, history of glaucoma and allergy to penicillin, and she has these kind of characteristic dots in the back of her eye, okay, with poorer vision. Right. She had a mild vitritis. Pretty good vision, right? Okay, with these multiple dots. And then imaging, her fluorescein shows some retinal vasculitis and some angiographic macular edema. But her fluorescein, her uh, ICG shows ca characteristic um, hypofluorescent spots that are probably more numerous than the dots we've seen there. Okay, so her laboratory workup um, was positive for HLA-A29. Okay, the diagnosis of bird trap and cordopathy in this patient. Okay. Major differential would be sarcoid, right? If the HLA-A29 were negative, you'd think about sarcoid. What other entity might you think about in an older patient that presents with, with that? Maybe a little more of botrytis. Lymphoma. Yeah, lymphoma. Right. Um, here's a younger person who presents with previous viral prodrome, okay? One week history of decreased vision in one eye, okay, and a history of a urinary tract infection. Decreased vision with these multiple placoid, that's how I describe these lesions, placoid lesions in the back of the eye, and uh, mild cells in the anterior chamber in vitreous. Her fluorescein angiography shows early hypofluorescence and late staining of these lesions. What white dot syndrome is this characteristic of? Ampy. Okay. Parapapillary scarring punched out mid peripheral scars, corralling vascularization in the presence of vitreous cells is characteristic of punched out. A. So, yeah, A. Idiopathic multifocal choroiditis, also known as multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis, also known as pseudohistoplasmosis. So, multifocal choroiditis and panuveitis syndrome, that's what it would be called. So birdshot is characteristically associated which with the following clinical feature. Let me, um, yeah, okay. This isn't really a good question, sorry. But what would be the best answer? What's the major vision? What's the major cause of visual loss in patients with acute visual loss? Cystoid macular edema. Okay, 
So iris nodules and posterior sneakia, usually you don't see that in birdshot, okay? Uh, vitiligo of the skin and the eye are seen in what entity? PKH. PKH, right. Punched out quarter lesions. The lesions that are associated with birdshot are creamy at the in the choroid, radiate from, from the nerve, okay? So that's some, sometimes, it's more like a, how to take a test question, you know, because you will get bad questions, right? Okay, coronary vascularization is reported in all of these entities except what? Or is a characteristic complication? A. A, right. Okay, it's an anterior uveitis. So, <coughs> idiopathic multifocal cortis or, or multifocal cortis and panuveitis pick um, and ocular histoplasmosis are, are three entities you think of. Of patients presenting with coronary vascularization and uveitis, okay. the most common. Serpiginous like choroiditis, okay, is okay. What is it due to? Do you think what what is serpiginous like choroiditis associated with? Exposure to TB. Right, so it is usually, it can be unilateral, but it, it can be bilateral. It's it's frequently complicated by coronal vascular membranes, and uh, it's more commonly seen in patients who are PPD positive. Okay. This is an example of a patient with a, a uh, multifocal choroiditis. Okay, this patient had a history of ocular surgery in, in the fellow eye. Okay, so we're talking about sympathetic ophthalmia. The differences between sympathetic and VKH, they're very, very similar diseases, probably share a similar pathogenesis. In fact, one of, I, there's a guy that I know that was charged with giving a lecture you know, at a national symposium on the difference between VKH and sympathetic, and he said, he got up and he said, surgery, and walked off. <laughs> okay, he was kidding, and then he went back up. And finish this lecture, but it's pretty much true. Okay, so previous ocular surgery or trauma you see in patients with uh, sympathetic, you may see vitiligo, poliosis, and alopecia with both entities. Okay, it's more characteristic of VKH, but you can see them in both. Okay, and then there's a pathologic distinction that may be an artifact of preparation, not an artifact of acquisition. Okay, but for board purposes, the choreo capillaris is usually spared in patients with sympathetic ophthalmia. Another way to put it, the chorea capillaris is usually involved in patients with VKH, okay? Because you're obtaining the pathologic specimen usually within two weeks, okay, uh, in a patient with sympathetic. So you have thickened uvea, non-necrotizing granulomas, inflammation of epithelial cells with pigment phagocytosis, lymphoid infiltration of the chorea and iris. This is the kind of question I'd like to ask you on the boards, okay, in sympathetic ophthalmia. You see RPE metaplasia um, into epithelial cells on Brooks membrane, also known as Dallin Fuchs nodules. Again, board question, okay, uh, with relative sparing of the retina and chorea capillaris. Okay. Again, probably an artifact of acquisition of the pathologic specimen. Uh, the treatment, classic teaching, is to nucleate the traumatized eye within two weeks to prevent the onset of sympathetic ophthalmia in the fellow eye. Um, it may be useful in delayed onset cases, probably diagnostically only, but not therapeutically. Um, and, you know, nucleation is usually is performed much, much less frequently uh, these days because, you know, there's way better uh, microsurgical uh, technique and repair of traumatized globes, plus we have good immunomodulatory therapy to treat patients. This is a exuded retinal detachment in a young person with BKH. Okay. Uh, this woman has uh, vitiligo and poliosis. The classic fluorescein angiographic signs are punctate inner uh, punctate areas of hyperfluorescence at the level of the pigment epithelium, which increase in intensity and leak and then pool into the subneurosensory space with exudative retinal attachment. This is a sequela of 
subrenal fibrosis in a patient that was inadequately treated uh, initially. Okay, so the importance of treatment I can't underscore uh, and treatment aggressively at presentation and continual treatment uh, after uh, you get the exudative retinal attachment under control. So the American UVI Society criteria for the diagnosis, no history of trauma or surgery, right? And then three of the following at some point in time in their disease, okay? Bilateral chronic iridocyclitis, which one sees in the late stage of the disease, um, which is the thing that actually uh, really blinds a lot of patients, okay? Cataract and glaucoma, and chronic anterior uveitis with, with his, that's left untreated. Posterior uveitis with exuded retinal detachment is an acute finding. Sunset glow fundus depigmentation of the RPE is something you see late in the disease, okay? And then neurologic signs of neck stiffness, tinnitus, cranial nerve, or CNS problems. Cutaneous findings include alopecia, poliosis, and vitiligo. This is kind of useful clinically, I think. Uh, differential diagnosis of exudative retinal attachment and uveitis, syphilis, posterior scleritis, central serous, uveal effusion syndrome, sympathetic, intraocular lymphoma, sarcoidosis. Not an important question, maybe, but who knows, maybe, you know, which of the following produce exudative retinal attachment? Um, differential diagnosis of Danlin Fuchs nodules, <coughs> definite board question. Okay. Uh, sympathetic, always think of that. VKH, you can also do it, sarcoid and TB. Okay. Um, this is a patient with hypopoia and uveitis and Bechet's disease. Okay. This classic 10% of patients present like this. This is what you read in the textbooks, but very few patients actually present with. Hypopion uveitis. It's a classic teaching of patients with Bechet's disease. <clears throat> more uh, commonly, the more blinding complication is a retinal vasculitis, which is an occlusive retinal vasculitis and retinitis. And you've seen patients with Bechet's. You can see in this series, this patient has, you know, significant occlusive vasculopathy uh, and staining of both the arteries and the veins with large areas of non-perfusion, you know, temporal to the macula. Um, ocular findings, occlusive retinal vasculitis, um, cotton wool spots, optic nerve edema, neovascularization, vitreous hemorrhage. Okay. So anything that produces an occlusive vasculitis can produce ocular ischemia, can produce neovascularization. Fluorescein angiography is actually a very useful test and, and prognostic. So if you see a large areas of ischemia, you know, you know this patient isn't going to do very well. Or you might actually consider prophylactic lasering them, depending upon, you know, the patient's situation. Systemic findings, oral, muca uh, oral aphthous ulcers, 100% of patients, okay? Um, erythema nodosum, classically taught, but most of the time patients have a more of acneiform rash. Thrombophlebitis, not only of the legs, but of the gut, okay? Arthritis, large vessel occlusion, so-called angiobechette's disease, and CNS disease. So patients can get CNS bechettes. So it's a multi-systemic disease. Here's a, a, a picture of a uh, app. This is not your typical canker sore. This is a erosive, painful aphthous ulcer. Um, differential diagnosis of oral ulcers, Dr. Troy. Bechet's, reader, writers, or reactive arthritis and sarcoidosis. Okay. Yeah. Switching gears, okay. We know here, this is a patient with uh, a vitreous hemorrhage, okay. Neovascularization of the periphery, leakage. This is a patient that has, happens to have a diagnosis of Eels disease or idiopathic retinal vasculitis, initially described by Henry Eels among uh, young Indian men with epistaxis, vitreous hemorrhage, and constipation. Um, it's usually bilateral, usually in patients with exposure to tuberculosis. Sorry, it's 8 o'clock. Um, floaters, decreased vision, and neovascularization. Uh, this is an example of a patient with tuberculosis. Okay, um, 
she was had a positive PPD. As you can see in this picture, she has a, a multiple multifocal choroiditis. Okay. This is another patient with tuberculous uveitis with uh, optic nerve involvement, multifocal choroiditis, and botrytis. This is another example of a patient with tuberculous uveitis with a tuberculoma. So, to answer your question, I definitely worked this patient up for tuberculosis. Okay. This is another example of a patient with probably a tuberculous uveitis with tuberculous serpiginous like choroiditis. Um, it is you, as a, we discussed this in fluorescein conference, okay? Usually uh, it is uh, bilateral, usually it is associated with vitritis and usually is multifocal as opposed to serpiginous in which the lesion comes off of the optic nerve. You see more areas of multifocality. In this or well, you know, um, I know I, the initial description was a unilateral disease, okay? But I think as more evidence has, as more cases have been reported, it's more bilateral. Um, TB is tough to diagnose, you know, uh, quantifier, the, um, it's a, you know, clinical uh, diagnosis with, um, you know, confirmatory uh, testing sputum. PCR is actually useful in the vitreous. Quantifier and gold assay detects latent, not active disease. That's important to know. Uh, chest X-ray may be normal in 50% of patients, so you can have extra pulmonary TB that presents in the eye. Okay. Um, one one case of TB, I mean, that have been reported in the literature that you always think about in a patient with a necrotizing, non-responsive scleritis, who's maybe from, you know, not from here, think about TB. The treatment, as you know, is, you know, with multi-agent chemotherapy. Uh, one of these medications needs to be monitored by ophthalmologist, right? Ethambutol for optic nerve uh, toxicity. Um, the incidence of uveitis is increasing in the United States. True. Quantifurone gold assay is a screening test for Lyme disease? No. Confirmatory test for active tuberculosis? No. Okay. Screening test for latent disease? Important. Okay. Um, I think I kind of gave this lecture to you a little bit. Uh, I'll give you the bottom line. All these guys have syphilis. Okay. Okay. You can do anything. Okay, there are distinct clinical presentations that they may uh, ask you about. Uh, acute, you know, placoid posterior choroidopathy. So you see these large placoid areas here. And then panuveitis with retinal precipitates. Think syphilis. They're pathognomonic presentations. Okay, you can also see optic nerve head involvement. Always good to consider syphilis. Always think about syphilis in your differential diagnosis. Um, always consider in the, in the differential, always test for HIV in a patient that you think has syphilis, um, and always treat them with neurological doses, okay? So give them a shot of penicillin in the butt isn't going to do the job, okay? They need to be admitted, they need to have IV treatment, they need to have an LP, okay, before and after treatment. This is a lady that has lymphoma, okay? Can you stick around for five minutes? Okay. This is a lady that has lymphoma. Uh, her story is basically she's been treated with steroids for a year, okay, and didn't get better, and had these subretinal precipitates uh, and vitritis. And she underwent a biopsy, or as, or as uh, they would say in the Sopranos, a biopsy. And I. Uh, it was positive for uh, poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm, and she underwent an IGH rearrangement, which showed a monoclonal B cell population. Okay, so you're going to get these kinds of questions. 45-year-old white male. It's a little young, okay, for this. Uh, laboratory workups unrevealing no neurologic symptoms, so nothing, nothing to suggest a neurological involvement. Uh, vitreous biopsy reveals monomorphic lymphocytes with large nucleoli, prominent nucleoli, and scanty cytoplasm. That's typical description of lymphoma cytopathology. MRI and LP are negative. Okay, the oncologist and ophthalmologist should recommend. Okay, certainly not observation, right? Repeat vitreous biopsy, you have the diagnosis. Okay, 
Intravitreal methotrexate or rituximab, yes, I think this is the way to treat them. The systemic and possibly intrathecal chemotherapy, controversial, but the evidence suggests that with uh, lymphoma isolated to the eye only, okay, that you treat the eye, okay, because of the morbidity associated with treatment and the fact that it doesn't necessarily prevent disease. It's controversial. A lot of people disagree with that recommendation, uh, but that's, that's what it is, okay? Have you ever uh, seen it in a person like young? Pardon me? Have you ever seen that in a person yeah, like young? Yeah, I have. Yeah, it's pretty unusual. So you would think it, so for intraocular lymphoma, you think about it in an older patient population, okay? So over the age of 65, okay? Patients presenting with uveitis that is initially responsive to corticosteroids that recurs, okay, upon discontinuation of corticosteroids. Patients present with sheets of vitreous cells, okay, that are uh, more prominent or more extensive than you would, uh, than the visual acuity would, would suggest. So these sheets of cells in the patients have relatively good visual acuity, okay, and sometimes these subepithelial infiltrates. So those are things that you alert <coughs> you to the diagnosis. Um, the diagnosis needs to be made by obtaining, you know, tissue. The vitreous is the place to, to go most of the time, although um, about 15% of the time you can make the diagnosis by doing LP. So part of the workup of a patient with lymphoma is, you know, ophthalmologic workup, uh, but also, um, you know, a neurologic workup, including an LP and MRI scan, okay? There are certain um, findings on imaging that are, um, that are very highly suggestive of this, including a leopard spot angiographic uh, uh, a picture, and um, the infiltrates of the, um, the subretinal and sub-RP infiltrates are frequently between the retina and Brooks membrane, so that's also something you frequently see. You can see that actually on, on OCT, as Brian actually presented last year. Um, the, uh, and then, you know, the treatment is uh, for just disease isolated to the eye, usually intravitreal injections. The problem is that, you know, um, that at least in my experience, 100% of patients end up having CNS disease, okay, and dying from that. So their survival is a little bit longer, but the evidence to date suggests that treatment with, with chemotherapy does not extend survival. Just want to go through these last questions, okay? Or and okay, so the following tests need to be performed on a patient with maintenance doses of prednisone. Okay, bone density scan. Important. Okay. All right. The most common side effect of mycophenolate is gastrointestinal. Okay, it's the most common side effect of any of the anti-metabolites. Okay, you need to know also that there's an increased risk of non-melanotic skin cancer associated with mycophenolate, okay? Not just in, okay? Which immunosuppressive medication is most likely to be associated with secondary neoplasms? Another way, another word to look at this, the site study showed that antimetabolites are not associated with secondary neoplasms or increased, morbid, or increased mortality. Cyclosporin is not associated with increased mortality, but the, anti the uh, um, cytotoxic agents, uh, cyclophosphamide and chlorambucil are, okay? This is the most common malignancy you see with cyclophosphamide is, is bladder, okay? So they need to be, uh, you know, cautioned to drink plenty of fluid so that the metabolites don't expose their bladder. And then, of course, secondary hematologic malignancies. Eileen okay. is gone. Infliximab therapy causes all of this stuff, okay? So usually congestive heart failure on higher doses, an IV, exacerbation of demyelinating disease, drug-induced lupus, lymphoma. Can't been reported in all of them. Skip that. Okay, just a word on AIDS. Again, CMV retinitis is the most common opportunistic infection in AIDS. This is CMV retinitis, okay? Three presentations of CMV retinitis. This classic pizza pie, uh, wedge-shaped, uh, ret multifocal retinitis, uh, usually uh, coursing along the, uh, the uh, nerve fiber layer, a peripheral retinitis, so-called granular brush fire appearance, 
and a frosted branch angiitis. Okay? Um, the incidence of CMV retinitis has plummeted okay, uh, with the advent of heart. Uh, the treatment of patients with CMV retinitis includes not only heart, but oral or systemic gancyclovir, uh, systemic valve gancyclovir, um, gancyclovir uh, because it, it, decreases visceral, it decreases the risk of visceral involvement. It decreases the uh, um, risk of the fellow eye, okay, and it and it decreases mortality, okay. Um, and then zoster is a can be a presenting sign of AIDS uh, in patients with CD4 counts that are greater than 200. Okay, so in the developing world, you know, in Africa, patients presenting with zoster, you think about you think about AIDS. They can get acute retinal necrosis, okay? They can get uh, porn, which is a variant of Paracella zoster, which, you see, uh, which is seen in patients with very, very low CD4 counts. That's it, it's a wrap. I hope that helps.